Welcome to Environmental Fridays. It is personal, season two. You can learn more about our topics and speakers by joining our Environmental Fridays Facebook group. This series is brought to you by Best Early, the Benton Spirit Community Newspaper, Andrews University Community Engagement Council, GC Scored, Every Piece Matters. Introducing your host, Dr. Desmond Hartwell Murray, and this week's co-host, Center for Community Justice Executive Director, Erwin Larrier. This week on Environmental Fridays, we'll be hearing from Professor and Associate Dean Jeffrey DeBelco. Well, we want to welcome everyone again. We have regulars on here. I see my sister. Is that my sister on here? Yes. I think, I think she came to see somebody, not me. <laughs> we'll support no, her later. I'm here to see both people. <laughs> All okay. people. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And we have Princess and Gloria and yes, the the team solutions from Benton Harbor. We have Ariana Fuller from South Carolina. Uh Keith, I don't know. Keith, um, who are you affiliated with? You could tell us. Um, but anyway, welcome to everyone, Melvin, Sandy, Leslie, welcome to all of you to our Environmental Fridays. This is uh, episode nine, Environmental Fridays, It Is Personal. And this is season two of our Environmental Fridays. Today, uh, my co-host is Owen Larrier, and he is the executive director for the Center for Community Justice. And it's a restorative justice driven, motivated organization. And it's based in Elkhart, Indiana. He's also assistant pastor of the Grace Place Church in downtown uh, South Bend. He holds professional qualifications in software development, uh, he has a BA in Biblical and Pastoral Studies, an MA in Theology, and is pursuing a PhD currently in Industrial and Organizational Psychology. But uh, having said all of that, the most, the best <laughs> qualification is that he is my brother-in-law. <laughs> anyway. Um, woo -hoo. Woo -hoo. <laughs> Anyway, my um, um, my sister is on here too. And so I guess she's here to see both Owen and myself. So thank you, Owen, for accepting to be co-host uh, today. Sure. And you will be introducing our speaker in a few minutes here. Usually what I do is um, say a little bit about why we started Environmental Fridays. It was mostly to help to incorporate um, this into my high school and um, college classes. We wanted to make chemistry come alive. I teach chemistry. We wanted to make chemistry come alive. And one of the ways that I thought of doing that was through connecting it and incorporating it into environmental issues. And so we tried to mentor our next generation. What um, I found, or any of us really, know is that today's generation of young people, I think are even more, uh, not think, but I know are more environmentally conscious than previous generations. Uh, but yet there is knowledge information that we could pass on and help mentor them. One of the fundamental things that we um, come from as well is the fact that life would not exist without the environment. That's just basic because uh, life and the environment exchanges energy and matter and the life depends upon the environment for that exchange. And because of that fundamental scientific reason, we should be humble to the environment and be stewards of the environment. And so these are some of the topics that we've um, covered and some of the topics that we will continue to cover um, because 
for all of these topics, we are part of it. We, we live in it. It is, it is very personal. We try to create an awareness in this series and hope that that brings enlightenment and also brings action. People would take it upon themselves to be more, to be stewards of the environment. So, Owen, it's your turn to introduce our speaker today. All righty, can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Good morning and welcome everyone. Uh, it's a privilege and an honor to serve in this capacity of welcoming our guest speaker. His name is Jeff DeBelko. He is a professor and associate dean at the Voinovich School of Leadership and Public Service at Ohio University, <laughs> as well as senior advisor to the Wilson Center's Environmental Change and Security Program. Uh, he was a lead author on the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's Fifth Ascent Assessment and is an author on the forthcoming Fifth National Climate Assessment. He is co-editor of Environmental Peacemaking and Green Planet Blues, Critical Perspectives on Global Environmental Politics. Welcome, uh, Professor DeBelco, and we want to hand over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you to both of you for this very kind introduction. And I really appreciate the opportunity to be in dialogue with all of you. And I do hope, um, despite my penchant for having too many slides, that we have an opportunity to have conversation. And so please jump in. If there are questions, we can take this wherever you'd like in terms of the focus. Um, so I am um, going to say a, a, a kind of word about biography. Dr. Murray suggested that that uh, kind of start would be um, appropriate. So I'm from Athens, Ohio, just south of you folks there in Michigan, down in southeastern Appalachian, Ohio, grew up here in a small college town, went uh, then for university. Um, here is given that it's a basketball uh, season. Here where I have actually hair, I'm on the floor there at Cameron Indoor Stadium at Duke University in a much earlier manifestation. Um, let's hope things go better than they have been recently for us. Um, so um, had opportunity to study political science and international relations. And so I think notable in this context as somebody who came to spend his whole uh, professional career on um, environmental issues and international environmental issues, but originally training on the social sciences and the political science that was um, focused on the foreign policy and the security policy and the peace building side of these kind of mix of topics as opposed to coming at it originally from the environmental side. I then um, uh, did my degree at the University of Maryland in part because I wanted to stay in DC where I'd started interning and, and um, working in various policy think tanks right after undergraduate school. And I spent and have spent and been affiliated with the Wilson Center, which is the photo on the, on the right. Um, uh, since 1994. So Wilson Center is really interesting. It's part of the government. It's under the Smithsonian umbrella, but it's it's the formal memorial to Wilson. It's Wilson was our only president to have a PhD. And so Congress in 1968 thought it appropriate to set up a living memorial where the worlds of scholarship and practice could come together and try to inform um, respectively. And so with our environmental change and security program, where I was uh, very fortunate to be director for 15 years, we're trying to bring that, those worlds of research and practice together, as well as in the issues of environment, peace building and security, some very different worlds that don't have a lot of um, experience talking with one another, even though we find there's a ton of overlap, a ton of reasons they need to, some shared interests, often some competing interests. The other photo is actually um, um, of the uh, here at Ohio University. Um, about a month from now, we'll have those uh, cherry blossoms out. That's a 1870s era, uh, what was originally a mental health hospital, um, treated a lot of what we call now PTSD um, in soldiers after the Civil War. Um, but it's the home of the Voinovich School of Leadership and Public Service, where I'm uh, currently a faculty member. I had a chance to in some ways come back to my hometown in 2012 and do uh, the professor thing, but stay active and engaged with the Washington policy. So. Um, for those of you trying to decide whether to go the academic route or the practice route, there are ways to kind of navigate both of these over time. So I urge you to keep, keep those options open. 
Um, uh, as, as was mentioned, I had the good fortune um, of being part of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and the one and only time, it turns out, to have a chapter devoted explicitly uh, framed as human security, and we'll hear how that fits in. Um, but understanding how climate change and security are linked in multiple ways, um, where climate is now really the kind of dominant conversation. It wasn't when I got started on these issues in 1990. Um, and so that's kind of the path uh, that I've um, taken and continue to walk on in various directions, <laughs> sometimes trying to do it at the same time. Um, but to, to set up this conversation, I think it's critically important that we abandon our stereotypes and rethink our assumptions. Right? I talked about how these fields don't often talk with one another, know each other, and they have often some kind of stereotypes and assumptions about the other that gets in the way of actually meaningful conversation, understanding dialogue, even when that dialogue's tough, even when the agreements are not there. One is, this is uh, my version of how the security community can view those focused on environment, right? The kind of activism perspective, idealistic, um, direct action, tree huggers, right? All the kind of pejorative frames that are reflective of reality in the terms of the kind of deep commitment to biodiversity and conservation and ecosystems. And at the same time, conveys a degree of unrealism and not connected to the, the kind of real issues of, of, of peace and security. Um, and at the same time, uh, the, it's also the direction the other way that the perspective on questions of conflict, peace and security are just about a, a toolbox that is unidimensional and good at blowing things up, but not building things, not cooperating, not um, negotiating um, and being in dialogue. And so these are kind of views of these worlds that we're constantly battling with, um, that we have to set aside if we're gonna have these deeper conversations and understand the multiple myriad manifestations of how these issues can come together, contested, you know, I, don't want to per, put it forward as uncontested or gospel or consensus on these linkages, but it's kind of necessary to enter the dialogue. Right? Um, so the dialogue is massive in terms of the topics and it really depends on whom you ask. And all of these topics are important. Um, some of them have garnered more attention. I'll spend some time on some of these, um, little to no time on others, but I think it's important to understand first and foremost, a, a dialogue around does the scarcity, or in some cases, the abundance of some particular resources, is that something that contributes to violent conflict, right? And that's a banner headline that gets a lot of attention. Um, important issue, uh, relatively rare compared to lots of other ways that environment and peace and security are linked, but gets a lot of attention. A little less uh, or a little more inclusive would be talking about the stability or fragility of political institutions and economy, right? So a, a even broader topic of how environment, natural resources connect to questions of policy, politics, institutions, and economies in ways that can aggregate up to be part of a, a primary foreign or even security policy perspective if one has a more inclusive notion of what constitutes a security issue. Environmental damages in times of war. This is one that's kind of um, first came to greater focus and attention with the use of defoliants in Vietnam in the late 60s and the early 1970s, led to some, some international law around uh, prohibiting the modification of environment as a tool of war, but one that uh, alas, we are seeing today and uh, can point people to um, the real, uh, real additional costs, uh, the true costs of what's going on in Ukraine today um, illustrates that this is not an issue that has um, gone away, sadly. Um, environmental impact on security institutions. I'll talk a little bit about this, but it's one way that the dialogue um, has become uh, a point of entry in terms of not talking, debating, conflict or not contributions, but understanding that if you are, um, as I'll show a picture, if you have our your largest naval base in Norfolk, Virginia, and you have sea level rise, um, that's an issue for the ability of the Navy to operate because of what it means for their infrastructure, their platforms, let alone their kind of missions. Similarly, 
changes because of climate change in the Arctic and what that means for missions and responsibilities and emergency response in what's essentially a, a new ocean um, in terms of its availability. Um, environmental, uh, environmental peace building. Um, I'll talk a little bit more in detail on this, but in some respects, it was a response to the environment conflict focus and said, you know, let's turn it on its head and think about environmental issues. They ignore political boundaries. So, and we have mutual dependence on rivers and water sources, for example. Can we not find ways to take advantage of that need to cooperate over time, or at least coordinate over time, or at least be interdependent over time as a way to try to build patterns of cooperation that increase trust and ultimately, hopefully, peace building in situations that are conflictual? Human security. So, really, kind of saying, hey, you know, that traditional Cold War notion. Uh, that's defining it strictly as a toolbox of the military and the use of force and a zero sum game is, is um, important, but not the whole story. And we need to go above and below the state, so to speak, down to individuals and up to the globe to understand that environmental issues pose, as Dr. Murr said, kind of fundamental, uh, fundamental for human well being as well as, as the kind of uh, the, the health of the planet, right? And so it was a critique to have a broader notion, really got a lot of attention in 94. And in fact, just last month, a new report from the same UN um, development program came out bringing this topic back to the fore. Ecosystem security. So talk to the biologists and they're gonna talk about is the ecosystem secure, not the humans, right? I mean, the humans are the problem making the ecosystem insecure. Just another example of kind of really depends who's across the table in terms of how, how you frame it and what, you, what the issues are. And finally, climate change, particularly since 2007 has been overwhelmingly the dominant frame and set of questions for the issues. Um, so apologies for taking probably more time than I should have to walk through it, but it gives you a sense of the diversity. And now we'll look at a couple of these pieces um, and, um, and, and, and dig in a little bit. So as I mentioned, this focus on, particularly in the mid nineties, does the scarcity of resources create conflict? And we have to remember, uh, I think a number of us on this call are old enough to remember, that the end of the Cold War meant that the lid came off on a bunch of, uh, in a bunch of places where we saw um, the kind of suppression of, of, of divisions were unleashed. Some kind of purposefully and with conflict entrepreneurs doing it other times, other reasons. But it really meant that um, the kind of, uh, you had, Somalia 93, Rwanda 94, Haiti 94, the West African conflicts in, in the same time period got a lot of attention. And the question in some ways progress was instead of just the kind of who's, who's battling whom, it was let's try to understand the underlying causes in terms of potential scarcity of, of land and, comp and, and equal distribution of land. Does that part of what is motivating um, or being used to kind of generate uh, anger and violence from one group against another, right? Um, and so what would be kind of on the surface attributed to different um, ethnic groups, um, also part of it was for a more inclusive understanding of what was driving some of this conflict. Um, so case studies were a big focus, got a lot of attention large end or quantitative analysis, the challenge really was that the data were not there or that they were not good or they were not at a level that allowed those methods to really try to understand correlations between X causing Y. And it was, so it ended up being largely limited in terms of where it was focused and largely rainfall was what they could find data for. And so the part of the question was, how can you say anything definitive if you're only looking uh, at higher levels of aggregation than the conflict is occurring and your data are crap, right? So garbage in, garbage out in terms of the quality of the research. Um, however, it did allow us to start trying to think more systematically. And this is a figure that Carl Brook uh, at the Environmental Law Institute in Washington, along with a whole bunch of people have put together to try to understand that while there was lots of, and still is lots of focus on does it, cause conflict that we need to look all along the conflict continuum for ways that environment, natural resource, climate change can be 
part of the problem, part of the solution. Um, part of the problem often, as you'll see, a lot of these uh, are human interventions, right? So governance, good, bad, or ugly really matters in terms of how we manage our resources, how we resolve our disputes around them, right? Do we have well-functioning dispute mechanisms around land tenure, or resource use, and such? But it really gives a sense that from conflict prevention before conflict, in times of conflict, getting out of conflict, and then building after, after conflict in a peace building mode, that we really need to look all along this continuum. Although I really like it when it's frankly a, a circle because what we know is one of the best predictors of conflict is having had a conflict, right? So actually I think the prevention and the post-conflict meet together. And so a circle for me um, is, is meaningful reminder that um, that's critically important. Um, one area that until just recently has been totally neglected by this field of environment and security, what we're calling, is um, a different kind of conflict, targeted assassination of environmental leaders. Uh, Berta Caceres from Honduras, a Goldman Prize winner, somebody who had achieved a lot of international renown, still targeted um, for assassination for her opposition to a dam in Honduras. Honduras turns out to be the most uh, violent um, country in the world in terms of environmental defenders being killed. But now we finally have people who are trying to track this um, and trying to understand what kinds of issues people are being targeted for um, and, and such. Um, and, and so these are some new data sets that I think are quite powerful and also indicate that um, the kind of traditional international relations security studies bias of unless there are 25 intentional battle deaths a year, it's not a case that actually it can be one person <laughs> can be hugely impactful in terms of the future of, of um, a, given, a given situation on the ground. Um, so that's sadly it's going on. It is however progress that we're paying more attention to it. I mentioned that human security was something that garnered a lot of attention in that same period around the end of the Cold War, where suddenly there was greater space for thinking more broadly about what security was. There was optimism about a peace dividend and such. Um, and so in 1994, a human development report put out a definition of human security that included environment, but also went to a number of issues of rights and um, protection, physical safety, housing, food security health-based ones, um, increasingly got more attention and acceptance. Um, well, I, I don't want to kind of uh, oversell it, but something that is just frankly uh, this year, 2022, just come back with a, uh, with a kind of refresh, so to speak, from the same institution at the UN that I think uh, and I hope will, will refocus attention um, on this more inclusive approach. We shall see. We can talk some more about that if, if that's of interest. Um, I always want to try to include some, some data in this as we get down. Here's an example, really, um, really interesting uh, research project that is ongoing at Oregon State University led by Aaron Wolf and a, a raft of graduate students. And they said, you know, let's talk about resources and conflict and resources and cooperation. And let's code all interactions between two or more countries around water for 50 years. They've now actually, I need to update this. They've done, uh, I think in the last 10 years um, and code them from most cooperative, signing a basin treaty agreement where two or more countries share a river or a lake or a sea uh, down to the most uh, violent, including formal, formal war. So again, between states, not within states, important to remember. And as you can see, there's lots of verbal hostility, so lots of saber rattling, um, but also a lot of verbal support and even a lot of cooper formal cooperation. And so this was, this seems in some ways fairly straightforward, but this research was absolutely critical, even within his tenure, uh, Secretary General Kofi Annan from, from Ghana went from talking about imminent water wars and our shared resources around water was a kind of a determined 
increased demand, increased number of people means that we're going to have water wars. To this is a this is an area that is uh, still has real basins at risk, but it's not about absolute scarcity. And if we have cooperative governance uh, efforts to build dialogue and shared understanding and move from rights to water to sharing benefits from a hydrological map, as opposed to then starting with the political map, then this is possible. And so to me, this is where when we're looking for areas of optimism um, and it's challenging, right? That we're, it's really tense right now in the Nile, which gets a lot of attention um, with the Ethiopian Renaissance Dam being built and uh, the threats that to Sudan and particularly Egypt. But um, it's, not, it's not easy, but it is um, more complicated than this kind of deterministic notion that more people, more demand, less water, therefore conflict, right? So it doesn't have that kind of determined path. Uh, and so instead, this, here's a few a bit more about kind of the approach of environmental peace building, finding ways to um, across the conflict life cycle, understand how these uh, interdependencies and working at multiple levels allows us to um, build some bridges, develop some patterns of cooperation not over promise and say, oh, it's gonna solve a problem or solve a conflict when the conflict is in fact, often over many other things as well. But it does give uh, what Ken Konka and I called um, the opportunity for lifelines of dialogue in times of conflict that, um, that kind of dictates the shared, the shared dependency uh, enables and in fact dictates some sort of cooperation. Climate security, um, as I said, uh, now is really the dominant frame. Uh, took off particularly in 2007 because science was accelerating in terms of understanding that it was perceived to be uh, much fast. It's not an over the horizon problem, but a today problem. So ability to attribute um, challenges occurring now. Prominent extreme uh, uh, weather events, although it's interesting if people are interested, we can talk about the differential ways that those have been received politically um, in, in terms of, of bringing people together or keeping them apart. Um, but I, I, I put it here or, or benchmark the 2007 because in that early 90s immediate wake of the post-Cold War, climate change was not seen as part of the security discussion. It was kind of too long-term, too diffuse, over the horizon, not intentional. So it's more recent that it has become so dominant. And in places that are the traditional locus of security discussions. So the 2007 is in part a benchmark is the first time that the Security Council had a session devoted to any environmental issues, climate change that the Brits brought forward. The Germans have subsequently done it twice. The Swedes, uh, we just had one this last, um, uh, this week, earlier this week, that interesting United Arab Emirates brought to the table. Um, so some actors that aren't necessarily intuitive ones given their fossil fuel dependence and, and, and such. Um, but not just the Security Council, also the assembly where all countries of the world have voice. And I think particularly given, um, uh, given the strong representation from, um, uh, from the islands, be interested to know that the small island states played an outsized role in this dialogue, um, particularly from pushback that says, well, environmental issues are important, but they're not security issues. A perspective that you would hear and still hear from Russia, from China, from Egypt, from Brazil, a lot of it based on a notion of territorial sovereignty and seeing this as an argument that could undermine the kind of rights of kind of control within political boundaries. Um, but the small island states very effectively said, really? <laughs> We're talking about existential threats to our, our uh, land area, <laughs> to our very homes. How can this not be a security issue? So um, that has really been a, um, a voice of clarity and uh, legitimacy in part because the case is so clear that this poses often existential threats for many of these places in the world. 
And so that's been critically important um, voice to come out of the General Assembly. Uh, Europe as well, Javier Solana was the first person to kind of lead on the foreign policy. They were a little bit after some of the US, but 08, 09, this graphic doesn't really work. Um, I've tried to put something in. This is um, uh, New York, if you do natural gas imports from uh, Russia to Europe on the New York Times website, you'll find this graphic much more effective. Um, but essentially, this now is a big part of the discussion about uh, dependence on natural gas and how, given the geopolitical changes, do we chart a path forward to reduce that dependency on an actor in conflict? Um, is it by increasing production of more fossil fuels that make that climate change problem worse? Is it uh, accelerating deployment of renewables? Is it bringing back on the table nuclear power that for many reasons, those on the environmental side are very wary of and often oppose, but it doesn't have the carbon profile that uh, the fossil fuels do. And so this is going to be part of the ongoing discussion that's gonna keep these issues um, in, the, in the forefront for sure. Um, and, and the US, and these are um, some statements that come from our, our kind of intelligence and military side to, to emphasize that it isn't just a kind of an advocacy argument from the environmental side, but those who are asked to assess all threats to the United States are including this, these issues as ones that, again, are not kind of explicit in and of themselves, but like so much of, it's so hard to kind of for folks to internalize this notion of climate. It's not just for the climate people on the climate side, but it has meaning for all the different areas of politics, life, economy, culture. Um, and, and so um, it, they kind of frame it that way. Particularly a threat already for already fragile states. And so it does connect back to some of those conflict dynamics, um, but also just threatening the legitimacy of countries that aren't able to meet the needs and expectations of their population. So a broader human security perspective. So making tough problems harder to solve. Uh, President Biden, to step back, I'd say in some ways, if you look back all the way even to Reagan, there's greater continuity of increasing attention um, across parties, whoever was president. There are definitely ebbs and flows. Probably the strongest ebb and flow was the most recent one between Obama, Trump, and Biden. Um, but President Biden on January 27th, so within the week of taking office, had a comprehensive set of uh, executive orders and charges to all his uh, departments and agencies, including the Defense Department, to understand climate change as a security issue, broadly defined, but within those portfolios. And so those reports have, have subsequently been rolled out by different agencies and departments, and we're starting to see um, kind of greater action through this frame. And again, in some ways, it's back to the beginning in terms of how these climate and security links play out. Some of them, you know, uh, herders and farmers, two different ways of earning a living have been in conflict in some respects for time immemorial. But the rate of change in a place like Sudan, that's already facing long term droughts, high levels of desertification are as well as the injection of small arms and, and the kind of means of making conflict much more deadly. Those, those two different ways of making a living often also divided by um, diff different ethnic and tribal groups are coming in greater conflict. And in the case of Sudan, make the regime in Khartoum a conflict entrepreneur that can turn this to their benefit, pitting one group against another. And then you have uh, the Secretary General talking about the genocide in Darfur as having some of these underlying climate and environmental uh, signals that are part of it. Um, but, you know, that's the kind of the tip, literally the tip of the spear kind of issues, but we also sea level rise and flooding, what it means for migration, disappearing water towers. So if we think of in the Andes, uh, glaciers and seasonal snow melt as being their water towers and those things disappearing, what that means for the broader uh, food security 
of literally tens of millions of people is, is the kind of agenda that is also part of this environment security link. We talked a little bit about the transboundary water um, competition. Uh, places I'll just mention, there's some really in-depth work on the Lake Chad region. Um, kind of in some ways, sadly, because <laughs> it's where in the UN, a number of a number of places were because of these political differences seen as off limits. So it's much harder to talk about the Syria case because it was active and ongoing in ways that had all sorts of international actors and highly contentious. Also the case in, in Lake Chad, um, but one that uh, they could navigate the politics of a deeper dive and a deeper focus. Here, for example, some work that Adelphi Research out of Germany has done for the G7 group of seven uh, countries. Um, also some work that they've done for the EU and for the UN, but really talking about how all these things come together in a really complex mix um, that is not uh, in any way entirely environmental. And in fact, one of their fundamental understandings was that it's like Chad has grown and and shrunk and over time. And so it's not unusual that it goes back and forth, but it's how the, how the responses um, occur and how the scarcities are dealt with are, are, are critically important um, and that climate makes these much more difficult to deal with. Um, one of the ways to get attention of the security actors is to talk about how this stresses uh, fragile states. So this graphic gives you a sense of just how severe this flooding can be with the, with the dark blue being severely affected districts. Um, this is 2010 floods that um, are you know, wiping away the, the crops and the livestock and the livelihoods for the populations along the river. So really it's not that this is causing Pakistan and India tensions per se, although the notion that India might be stealing water with new dams upstream is part of, part of that dialogue. But it's trying to have folks understand how these climatic uh, uh, exacerbation of regular flooding events can be something that security actors need to pay attention to if we're interested in the the stability of an uh, important country like Pakistan. This gives a sense of just how many people and, and the large percentage of populations of already fragile places have high levels of uh, climate risk. And so already fragile, laying on top of the fragility, the climate drivers means that uh, countries uh, all over the world um, have big parts of their population. Um, are, are getting this kind of double exposure, which uh, again is not an argument about one causing conflict, but the kind of multiple stresses perspective that was this analysis from, from Josh Busby, Busby and colleagues. Josh was at UT Austin at the time. He's now seconded to uh, work on climate security issues at the Department of Defense. Um, migration gets a lot of attention for uh, how this may play out. Um, the the colored figure there from Central America and the Andean region gives a predicted um, crop yield difference um, by 2050, between 2010 and 2050. And so if it's brown, it's bad. <laughs> um, and so decline in, in crop productivity in part because of anticipated climate impacts, largely a lot of the availability of water. Um, and so, Given what we already know about historic migration patterns, this is where the challenges of being able to, to, um, to uh, have a livelihood based on agriculture um, is now. Uh, there, the migration scenarios are much, much more complex. And so the deep dive research on this, of course, it's not the poorest of the poor who move, it's incredibly brave and takes resources and takes social networks and such to, for people to move. Uh, but nevertheless, this is um, seen as a relevant dimension of understanding patterns of migration in the region going forward. Um, and you know, uh, militarized boundaries are ones that uh, we know something about in this country, as well as um, 
you know, Bangladesh, which is often held up as one of the most vulnerable countries to sea level rise and extreme weather events. Um, the militarized border with India still, and I need to, to confirm this, but still has portions of it that are not just kind of militarized with a boundary, but has rules of engagement that are almost kind of shoot on sight, right? So it really, the security institutions on the Indian side are empowered to stop this migration with the use of force as a legitimate uh, means. So some really um, troubling. I don't, I, I sometimes hesitate to use the Bangladesh example because it is so often used and sometimes abused, but um, nevertheless, I think it is critically important even as we know that most of the migration associated with extreme weather events and some of these changes are within states as opposed to across the states. And we spend a lot of time talking about uh, people who cross political boundaries. DACA is overwhelmed by people in already overwhelmed infrastructure because a lot of the migration is internal and rural to urban. Uh, bringing it home, here's a slide that was developed for the Department of Homeland Security by the Department of Transportation under the Obama administration when DHS, the newly created Department of Homeland Security that has FEMA, Coast Guard, immigration, um, said, why does this climate change have to do with us? <laughs> well, here's expected sea level rise um, in the Gulf over the next hundred years. Let's, let's map that onto transportation networks, how we move, bring into the country and refine fossil fuels. Um, this is something that held real impact um, from a broader security sense for the United States as well. So it's not just a over there, out of sight, out of mind. Um, I mentioned the Hampton Roads infrastructure and what it means for the Navy. This is something developed by a group of retired generals and admirals who took a look at the climate science and tried to understand what it would mean for the security community, really influential voice actually in an agenda setting. And so dramatic uh, infrastructure threats from sea level rise in part, because they're also in a, just happen to be in a situation where the land is subsiding as well. And so it exacerbates the, the impact of, of higher water levels. The Arctic, I, it, this, I need to get a new one because this is even worse than <laughs> this, this slide, but the creation of a new, uh, essentially a new uh, ocean uh, creates greater race for resources and extraction in places that haven't been accessible before. Game changer in terms of transport largely of Russian fossil fuels to Asia, which again is going to probably uh, be even more important, uh, especially if um, other countries decide they're not going to buy Russian fossil fuels. Some maritime boundary disputes, but uh, a lot of concern. Um, the Coast Guard folks in that session I facilitated at Homeland Security came into the room thinking, what am I doing here? Why does this matter? And left it saying, oh my goodness, you know, we were using half the Coast Guard assets for the relief of the initial earthquake in Haiti. What if we have a deep water horizon scenario up in much colder, much um, less calm waters up north, and we have this another similar scenario, we just don't have the assets to, to provide that kind of response. Um, and I, I realize I need to speed up a little bit, but one of the areas that we worked um, that I'll just go through very quickly, but Spent a lot of time on, okay, what do changes in access to resources and environmental conditions mean for conflict? Part of what I think we have historically neglected is thinking about how we respond to climate by trying to mitigate or adapt to it. That can be done well or poorly. And in fact, if it's done poorly, we have lots of analogous experience that suggests it can be unjust and actually create conflict or factor into existing conflict. So we need to really put a strong lens on what the IPCC report that just came out last week said it was maladaptation, right? Adapting for whom at whose cost, right? And um, whether that's uh, all sorts of kind of historical, does that reinforce historical lines of inequity or does it actually, is it adaptation for all? Um, and you kind of, we try to walk through and I'm part of a report that's coming out of the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute in May and later in September as well, that tries to 
uh, the challenge is to how to not make it a list, but go through the different ways that we are trying to move off from fossil fuels and understand where the potential for conflict is. Um, you know, biofuels, you have the Europeans changing their transportation targets for biofuels in, in transport, you know, hailed as a great step towards dealing with climate. Um, Silas Siakor, on the ground environmental leader in Liberia says, that's great, this makes you all feel good about taking serious climate change, but you are, it's at the cost of, of food security for Liberians because you're buying up cheap land in Liberia and pushing people off the land, right? So some unintended remote consequences that have to be considered. Um, hydro, solar, new, we can talk about this more if you like, but it's kind of a, something where we're saying systematically, we need to look at these issues. It's also, <laughs> And I'm sorry to say uh, the headlines are making it clear that the petro states who are heavily dependent on fossil fuels for their source of income are not going silently into the night. Um, U.S. should be on here too, notably, um, although we're not, it's not such a percentage of our, our um, GDP that it kind of qualifies by the criteria that appears here. But um, we have yeah, we have a, a real challenge in terms of uh, what the foreign and security policies are those moving, if the world's moving away from fossil fuels, which is un unfortunately debatable. Um, the other, uh, you know, the old game, same as the new game, it turns out renewable energy technologies are really dependent on critical mineral inputs that have the same old dirty extraction and processing processes uh, and that they are not distributed evenly around the world. And so there's an equity of access issue. There's a geopolitical dimension, particularly since China has uh, much of the processing and in some cases, high percentages of critical inputs. So immediately gets the security community's attention because it's also critical inputs to, 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 to military and communications technology as well as environmental. Um, but this is one that um, is also uh, folks had talked about, well, we don't need to worry about the Russian economy. It's just a big gas station. Well, they also are the third largest producers of nickel and nickel is a key ingredient to the battery technology for EVs. And, you know, so it's these things, unfortunately, will be with us as, as issues. Finally, to maybe think a little differently than this kind of security realm and suggest that part of why having these dialogues are can be revealing in positive ways. Those of you uh, on this webinar will remember that in the second Bush administration, Bush 43, one of the ways that those who wanted to slow progress on taking climate change seriously said, you know, wait to more science. We need to better understand these. We don't understand everything about the science. I think the fact that the security community spends a lot of money on essentially the precautionary principle and risk analysis and says, we need to act in the face of uncertainty because if we wait around, it'll be too late is perfectly analogous to this conversation why we can't wait around for perfect science. And of course, perfect science is misunderstanding the whole enterprise of science and discovery and testing, right? But, but um, so the notion of precautionary principle, redundance and flexibility, making big decisions, spending a lot of money on unknown or low probability outcomes, but ones that you want to avoid um, is something that is actually make, making that more acceptable in the environmental realm would be actually quite useful. I say that as somebody who sits in Athens County that has the largest per gallon injection wells from fracking wastewater fluid in the whole state of Ohio. And you know we're doing it part because we can't prove that it's gonna uh, yet foul our water supply. Um, but if we had a precautionary principle, we might say, you know, because we don't know, maybe we shouldn't be doing this, right? So this notion of applying that precautionary principle. And finally, Scenarios and role playing over and over and over again, I think uh, is something that we would be wise to kind of game out some of these and use those tools. So I think uh, finally, it really requires that we get out of our silos. So this is a, not a picture of failure, but a progress in, in understanding that um, 
they aren't just separate fields. We need to integrate our analysis with a much wider set of players, bring some of these big global discussions where global average temperature changes are, or parts per million are our indicators and bring them down to some of those um, places and understand what it means for food security and economy and livelihoods um, and for how and where we live and that will be quite meaningful. And that definitely some of the tools of the security community, uh, the zero sum perspective uh, are mismatched, uh, yet there are also some opportunities from some of those kind of methods and approaches that um, can be taken advantage of to make progress in this space. And now, finally, I'll shut up and we can have a conversation. So um, <laughs> back to you all. Okay. Owen? Yeah. Yeah. We think it's yeah. the same thing. <laughs> it's That's a uh, lot. This is a lot. And as a wow. matter of fact, I, I just want to say, everyone, let's just thank Professor Jeff right. for, for sharing this. Um, one of my one of the areas that presents quite a bit of challenge in the restorative justice and peace building framework is how do we make this equitable how but more importantly more accessible because i don't believe until our feet are being squeezed by a very tight shoe. I don't think the general population is going to respond to this. And your last, your last slide says here, um, not just over there. And I think that's a large part of what is happening, particularly across this particular country. And I can't speak for others, um, but until it hits us, I mean, remember the movie, Aaron, what's the name? Aaron Brockovich? Yep, Brockovich. Brockovich. and the the it was based on a story of environmental pollution mm -hmm. of mammoth proportions in days when we, we didn't even know any of this. Mm -hmm. And when we come to our urban centers, we see the disparities being demonstrated in the lack of resources for some groups. The hoarding of resources and abuse of resources by other groups. And there's a, a sense of, you know, as long as it doesn't bother me, I'm not really gonna worry about you. Mm -hmm. So at one point I felt like, where's the hope? <laughs> <laughs> but, but however, I, I like the fact that first and foremost as security services in general, are keen to see, they're trying to figure out what's gonna come. They've mm -hmm. seen something on the horizon and I think you're particularly persuasive in, in not just being activistic with a purpose in mind. So it's not about tearing down stuff and one, you know, you're going to reverse everything as you have it. But more importantly for me, it's about how do we best do what we do? How mm -hmm. can we not so much mitigate but how can we bring all of these diverse communities to the table while we are meeting as best as we can each other's need, especially as far as food and land security is concerned. So mm. that was a lot I said. I'd like to open the floor to questions. Um, is anyone, if you want to, you can turn your, your, your microphone on and let's start with your questions. So who's got the first question? Should uh, Dr. Murray, should we start with you and then let others build up confidence? <laughs> we have lots of confident people on here. <laughs> Trust well, me. I'm I, I don't... Some of the names here, they are not afraid of asking questions. <laughs> well. Uh... All right, who wants to go first? It's, this is Laurel Berman. I have a question. Laurel. There you go. Um, you know, we had two classes this week at Andrews, um, one in toxicology where we learned about what I call the uh, petroleum chemicals, BTEX, benzene, tylene, ethylbenzene, xylene. And we learned about um, their volatile organic compounds. We talked about the city of Holbrook, Arizona, where the lower half in elevation is floating on a plume of petroleum contamination, which is sitting 
on top of their depth to groundwater, not their aquifer where they get their drinking water, but their groundwater to a depth at six feet below surface. So people had to be evacuated. They cannot live. This is all about petroleum, right? And Arizona is one of the sunniest places in the planet, you know, and there is a solar car. Her name is Stella. Um, and apparently she's not aesthetically pleasing, but getting better. You know, so we, we have the technologies for renewables. And it's, um, so we learned about petroleum chemicals and then we learned about a national green energy plan. Going back to Jimmy Carter, who started the first solar energy research institute, which is now the National uh, Research Energy Lab. So 50 years and how much progress have we made? And this is the question, you know, these poor students, besides the fact that I'm screaming, don't clean your house with scrubbing bubbles, use vinegar and, and dish soap, <laughs> you know, because you're gonna have bad indoor air quality. So it dawned on me, I'm like, why is this so hard? And I realized how much money is in oil and crude mm -hmm. and the, the tar sands and the amount of environmental destruction we've done to bring those pipelines across the world that carry natural gas and crude uh, petroleum product. It, is, is, it, is it money? Is it because people make a whole lot of money off of non-renewable resources or fossil fuels? What, what is the big obstacle? You know, we say security, I, I think it's economy. Mm-hmm. Is the economy stupid? Is the economy stupid? Remember that? <laughs> Remember that? Oh boy. Yeah, I know. And what was fascinating to me, I don't know if it's connected. I, I'm thinking it might be, because I've never heard until this morning that there is assassinations of environmental activists because you're messing, because they're ultimately messing with their money. That, that's how I'm interpreting this. I mean, why else would they go and try to, to you know, bump off somebody who is trying to, you know, help the environment? Yeah, there's been a lot of assassinations in the Amazon region. I didn't know this. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Did you, do you all remember, it wasn't that long ago in, in China, um, young people discovered that these big multi-unit, huge apartment buildings were built on top of toxic waste. And they were protesting in the streets for like the first time since Tiananmen Square, you know, just, wow. you know, and then all of a sudden that goes away. And, yep. mm -hmm. and by the way, Erin Brockovich is still at it. I'm very proud to say she's, yes, she's she still is. quite an activist. I've oh, tried to reach out to her, but she's probably too busy for us she is she's big potatoes <laughs> i know i know <laughs> we're all small potatoes <laughs> <laughs> this is really i mean one of the there are many different notes i wrote down here one of the things that also struck me at the in the last slide or so is what you refer to as the precautionary principle mm -hmm. And it just kind of struck me, okay, just on the surface, a precautionary principle should be a conservative thing. And yet, and yet, it doesn't play out like that in the politics. No. Does it? No, that's right. That long-term versus short-term thinking. Yes, I've, I, I, I didn't get very far with arguments about how, um, a conservative argument around fossil fuel extraction in the United States would be one that keeps it in the ground yeah. as an insurance policy um, and, and as we transition to renewables and have others uh, you know, consuming from others yep. would actually be the, the kind of security, conservative security approach. Exactly. But I think to, to Laurel's intervention, I think the short-term um, interests of actors who are operating with a kind of immediate profit driven bottom line uh, and interest base, whether that is big companies that we're very familiar with or um, uh, landholders in the Brazilian Amazon who want to clear the rainforest and the people who are dependent on it to raise cattle to export beef to <laughs> 
back to us, right? You know, mm -hmm. looking in the mirror in terms of um, who's who's ultimately the problem. Uh, you know, those those diamonds mined in West Africa are not going for rings on the fingers of people in West Africa, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's an international market, right? So part of the part of the challenge too there in that kind of '90s discussion was it made the local conflict and put all the blame on the folks there and didn't look at these kinds of larger global uh, economic trade routes and such and how the culpability for driving these were, were so so much there. And so, yes, alas, um, Dr. Murray, I, it, it, I too kind of felt um, like we just really missed um, a hugely important set of issues around the targeted assassination of people. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, we've, um, we've seen uh, literally like Mexican butterfly protection, habitat protection activists wow. assassinated in part because it butterfly? coincides with valuable timber. Wow. Right? And, you know, so, um, it, you know, certainly, certainly in, in a number of places, um, this is the case. But, you know, if we think about, uh, you know, how water rights were negotiated, stolen, procured in the American West, mm -hmm. I mean, we can go back and watch uh, a very young Jack Nicholson and the violence around water for California. You know, I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it, it is, it's one that it, again, it's not inevitable, but it's about the kind of governance and re conflict dispute resolution mechanisms and bringing, bringing arguments about kind of long-term as well as short-term interests to bear. Um, and that's where it can be very challenging. But I think, you know, I, I do think, uh, although he's having a terrible time getting the approach through Congress, uh, President Biden is onto something when he talks about, on the one hand, responding seriously to climate, not seeding the market on renewables to other parts of the world, right? It, they're mm -hmm. German and Danish and Chinese companies that are developing some of the best renewable technologies, not the United States. And we're not building them here. So it's an argument to, to, to bringing the unions and the kind of renewable industry together in ways that have often been in opposition, right? right? Economics versus environment and saying, in fact, yeah. that there are pressure, even though they're politically powerful, there are actually precious few people working in mining of fossil fuels, particularly coal, mm -hmm. um, still emotive and really important cultural issues, right? And we're here in Appalachia, it's hugely important. Mm -hmm. um, but the reality is that there are far more people working in renewable energies and technologies in Ohio than there are mining coal. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. finding ways to act on that, um, that tries to uh, kind of do well <laughs> by doing good uh, is critically important. And also recognizing the historic neglect of particular communities around points of extraction in cities and, um, uh, and poor marginalized people are ones that um, really that kind of mitigation and adaptation for whom needs to include those voices that have historically been not at the table and have not been sharing of sharing of benefits and have been bearing a disproportionate uh, part of the burden um, because the least responsible as we say in climate change are the most vulnerable and so mm -hmm. that needs to that needs to be front yeah. and center in the approach yeah, yeah I, and, I and one of the biggest voices <clears throat> that I think she should be the next Secretary General of the United Nations is um, Prime Minister from Barbados, Mayor Motley. Oh boy, her speech oh. was so good. Oh, oh boy. So good. yes, yes, yeah. yes. And she spoke directly about that, that the least responsible is bearing the brick, biggest brunt of this whole environmental climate change issue. And reality. Yeah, I was I was very pleased to see the United Nations Environment Program recognize her as one of the champ one of their 2021 champions of the earth. Yes, she yes, really, uh, yes. Very powerful. Very eloquent. Yeah. Yes, yes.
and speaks with authority and legitimacy exactly. of, of you know of those communities, right? I mean, that's exactly that's. Um, I mean, it's happening to Barbados. Probably. It's happening to her island. Yeah, yep. it is national security. Yep. I mean, we have a there's a problem of sargasso uh, uh, seaweed mm -hmm. and how it's affecting the coastline. Mm -hmm. It's choking off the ability for fish to be to come close in. That's just one of them. Mm -hmm. uh, where I grew up, the beach used to extend maybe two, three hundred, two hundred feet out. Now the beach is close to thirty feet on you know away because of the erosion. Wow. is absolutely crazy. Water production, water rainfall are right now when it rains, they're having floods almost each time. Wow. There is a shortage of water. So mm -hmm. even the subterranean um, and the aquifer, the, the, they're, they're overfull, overfull or they just are bone dry. And it all happens in the same six months of the year. So wow. yeah, this is a, this is real. real I, I don't know how much you know about the Commonwealth Secretariat. Uh, it's like you could call it the United Nations and former British colonies, even though it includes mm -hmm. a couple others. Mm -hmm. They have been doing the working on this forever because the countries, the Maldives, um, PNG, places like that have. This is what has been affecting them even before it became a thing. Mm. And there are some places I, in the Maldives, there were several islands and the islands are no more. Hmm. People used to live there. They have to move away and go to the, another island. And back in the 80s, just to, to bring this closer to home, the assassination of environmental activists, even though they weren't called that back then, this was a rampant, this was rampant in the in south america hmm. so if this is this is something that's been going on but it is only now because of the work perhaps of you and your colleagues and other activists talking about this and making it a thing uh that we are beginning to have this response yeah I didn't it was never a thing yeah. yeah so jeff you have given us given me like subject matter for the next um, five years or something. Um, like almost every one of your slides had at least one or two um, topics that we could have a speaker for for another 40, 50 minutes. I mean, there is so uh, much to glean uh, from it. And I think it's I think it's a good thing that we you gave us that sort of global view of how the environment, peace building, conflict, you know, is connected, not just in a in a sort of causative way, mm -hmm. but in a way that's sort of like just part of how it's a it's another factor to consider. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we're living through it right now with Putin's war. Yep. You know, Jeff, what's interesting uh, was one of the interesting things for me is that we have all of these communities who've owned so much land mm -hmm. and where restorative justice and peacemaking and living out the resurrection life. I'm sure you've heard those type of phrases. It is now one of the things how they're looking at their environmental impact. Because how can I knowingly enrich myself, not necessarily in terms of the pure riches or greed, but by living knowingly impact you by the downstream of everything that I've done. That's a, that's a big thing that conversation is going on now. So mm -hmm. thank you for, for sharing the, all of these things with us today. Yeah. It's oh. made me think now. Oh, it's it's my it's my pleasure, and I uh, thank you, Dr. Murray, for all of the sessions that you have uh, organized previous and will going forward. It's a great service that you do to keep these conversations um, 
in the front of our minds and bring folks together, some of whom have the chance to work together and some of whom are, are, are just meeting for the first time. So we, I, I, I'm, uh, uh, I'm teaching our, uh, our graduate students here now that it's that kind of dialogue and engagement across groups is critically important and we can't just talk with, uh, and, uh, preach to the converted, right? We need exactly. to talk across the different, Exactly. And at the same time that um, the kind of deficit model, well, if people just understand more than they do the right thing is also, uh, mm -hmm. you know, necessary, but not sufficient to, to get us over, over the hump because these things, as the political scientist says, uh, they're, you know, the science is hard, but it's just the first step and uh, mm -hmm. understanding how these things play out. That's and right. it is it is the the tough stuff about doing the dialogue and the peace building and finding common interests and ways forward. So yes, correct. appreciate all the efforts that you're doing towards that end. Thank you so much. Thank you so and thank you for accepting the invitation <coughs> to be part of this series. And you've given us a lot to think about, to act on, and to in fact um you know contact make contact with other persons in these different areas and have them also come and present uh to us is there any anyone else that has a question or a comment okay well if well, not i do i have a comment okay <laughs> um i'm listening to this and i'm not as educated in the area of environmental or science or some of the other areas. I'm the everyday common person. I'm that person that's listening to this and I have gained just a wealth of information. And I wanna thank our presenter, especially our speaker um, for being on here today. But it's what the speaker said at the very end. Dr. Murray, I wanna thank you because you are opening up not just our minds, but you are giving us, you know, they say knowledge is power, you're impacting us and you're empowering us with information that I probably would have never dug so deeply into environmental. Now that I'm listening to this, speakers, this speaker and others, this Environmental Friday, it is really crucial um, for it to be sustainable. And I just um, encourage all of you to reach out to others to join every Friday. I am learning so much as this everyday common folk person thinking, oh, do I understand this? And the more I'm listening, the more I'm being educated and I'm beginning to understand. And now it's something that Dr. Murray says, it is personal, ladies and gentlemen. It's personal for us and our well-being of our family and of our country and of this place we call the world or earth. And I would encourage all of us to get more people on these calls they could be like me saying, oh, I'm not a scientist. I'm not an environmentalist. I'm not as, as astute as the speaker we just had. But Environmental Fridays is crucial to have more people to join. I learned so much today. And in the previous um, segments that you've had series, I am so pleased to be part of this today. And I just want to grab and tell other people to come on board because knowledge is power. And yes, it is personal. It is so personal. And thank you, Dr. Murray, for hosting these series. That's pretty much all I wanted to say. Thank you, Princess. You have just earned yourself a large portion of jerk chicken. <laughs> I'll do the Caribbean uh, example too. <laughs> I, I truly mean this from my heart. And I know. I just know there should be ways we should be engaging other groups, other mm -hmm. schools, mm -hmm. other departments to be part of this, these series that you're having. Mm -hmm. They're impactful, they're educational, and it's real. We're beginning to see things right around us happening. And these speakers with their expertise, they're helping us to understand and to learn more. So mm -hmm. I'll take my Caribbean and jerk chicken <laughs> and oxtail too and the okay. red snap. Uh, this, okay. <laughs> you know, this is with a purpose. Okay. It's personal. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. So, yes, um, I think if there are no more comments or questions, we'll end today. But we also want to 
um, give a shout out to next week. We have a speaker, I think Halen from New York City and talking about green cities. So that should be very interesting. But again, we want to thank this week's um, guest speaker um, for a very good global view of what's going on in the environment, peace, conflict, economy. He covered it all. Um, thank you so very much. And um, next week, we would like to see us all back here for Environmental Fridays. It is personal. Take care, everyone. Thank you very much. Take care. All right. Bye-bye.